Hey, I'm back. Um, all this COVID stuff is leading to lots of cooking, um, so I have some great things to show you today. Um, last uh, night, um, we put the tartine, Maddie and I put the tartine recipe uh, into the fridge to proof, and then this morning I baked a loaf of uh, a tartine country bread, um, which came out okay. Um, I'm not totally happy with it. I like how it, how it cooked along the edges here with these big holes. This feels very like very much like the bread consistency I was going for. Um, this here is a little spongy and dense uh, in the middle. Not spongy in a good way, it's like dense. And that could be a couple of things. Either um, we didn't proof long enough maybe to get some of that extra rise in there for those bigger bubbles. Um, it could also be our mix of flowers. Um, we were all kind of out of it last night as we were putting together the flowers and like we might not have exactly gotten the balance of whole wheat to white quite right and there were like a couple of different um, cooks uh, <laughs> in that one um, so we had some different uh, outcomes but we're gonna try it again there's another um, loaf proofing longer here in the fridge I'll show you that so we'll take a look at this guy obviously it's a slow proof here um, in the uh, in the fridge so it can go 12 hours uh, so once I take it out um, before baking you want to let that sit now for maybe um, an hour or two before you put it in so it can fully come to room temperature um, before you bake it. So let that proof more and then maybe tomorrow or the next day I'll bake another loaf and we'll see if the added proofing time leads to bigger bubbles. Um, and if not, then we'll just try to get the flour right next time. So this looks good here. These bubbles are great. That's about the size of my finger that I can get uh, good, good sized bubbles. When you go to Tartine, the bread is just loaded with these wonderful bubbles. It's almost like, damn, why did I pay so much? Why did I pay eight bucks for this loaf when it's all um, just air? But it's so good. Um, this outer crust too, this I'm really proud of. If you look at that, there's probably, that's like a three millimeter, um, nice brown crust, it's even all around, and it's good and crispy. And there's all this yummy um, mix of rice flour and, uh, and, and regular flour that goes on top. Okay, so that was this morning's project. And as it turns out, um, and last night's, and if you want to start the culture from scratch, it's gonna take you about two weeks. Um, to get your culture ready uh, to use for baking. Um, mine, I've been, this has been going for years and years, so it's totally healthy. And you can put it to rest if you want to take a break from baking. You can put it in the fridge and have it rest. Uh, but now if I listen to this, you can actually hear uh, the yeast uh, going and farting away in there and bubbling up uh, inside there. It sounds like a fizzing soda, but of course it smells like sourdough. Um, so if you want to keep baking, you don't want to feed that culture about um, twice uh, once or twice a day, about a tablespoon of flour and a tablespoon of water um, is fine. Um, now the, the tartine recipe says to use um, uh, half whole wheat and half um, white flour in your starter. And I, that's the only thing where I differ from the recipe because I've been doing this starter for a long time. And from what I remember from making pizza um, and, and bread long ago, um, is that the, uh, uh, the whole wheat tends to slow down the starter. Um, and I don't get as much production. I don't get as much of that nice um, that, that fizzing sound uh, when I use whole wheat. So um, maybe I'll try it if I can't get the bubbles I want um, after I try this a few more times. I might switch to adding whole wheat feeders to my um, half and half whole wheat and white feeder to my uh, starter, and then maybe um, we'll get the results. Okay. So why did I tell you about the bread? Because there was extra dough, extra leaven. Um, so I made um, some pizza crusts and. What I did with these, um, they're kind of rustic, which is, uh, my daughter made a funny comment when she says rustic is just a code word for fucked up. Um, so yeah, these are my fucked up uh, pizza crusts, and uh, there's four of them, um, and they're cooked for maybe two or three minutes. Um, so I made the dough, uh, rolled it out, um, and then um, threw it into these little uh, personal pizza sizes, and then I put it in this pizza oven here. This is a, um, a stovetop pizza oven that my daughter got for me, I think for my 40th birthday. And uh, it'll get up to, with enough juice coming out of the stove, it says you can get this up to 900 degrees. The best I've been able to do is about 550 or 600, which still makes a pretty good pizza. So a couple minutes um, in, the, in the oven, uh, when it's just like this, just dough alone, um, will give you a little thing you can work with. And I find it's much easier to work with a, a, a partially cooked piece of dough than to try to work with a fully topped pizza. So that's one little trick that I do. Um, also, the Sicilians, so both sides of my family are Sicilian, the Sicilians use um, uh, like long uh, rectangular pans, kind of like a, kind of like this. So you might um, see a Sicilian cook a pizza in a pan like this. Uh, if he's nice, he'll probably clean it out for you first. But um, So it's kind of like a, maybe like an inch deep. 
And they'll fill the dough, they'll, they'll uh, coat the bottom with olive oil, they'll fill the dough in here, and then the toppings on top and bake that. And they cut it into square pieces. Um, and that's typically what this piece look, looks like. And one of the things I, I got from my um, grandfather on my um, mother's side, my, my mother's father, um, was an incredible uh, pizza maker. And um, he would take um, onions, we're going to grab an onion, and we're going to um, really uh, cook it a lot. We're going to cut it up real small and cook it so it's uh, really brown. And then we're going to press um, that sort of onion and like olive oil um, to cook in olive oil. We're going to press that mix into the dough and into the bottom here, under the sauce. And then, so the onions, it's almost like I'm making onion focaccia. Uh, and then we're going to put the pizza right on top of that. So sauce and cheese and toppings. Um, I never want anything on top of my pizza that wasn't first cooked a little bit. So for example, a mushroom, which I, I love. Um, I don't want a raw mushroom on my pizza. I want it cooked a little bit. So I'm going to give it just a light touch in the cast iron and then on top. Same thing with peppers too. There's nothing worse than having a, a raw piece of pepper on your pizza. Uh, so, well there are probably things worse than that, but you get the idea. Okay, last thing I want to tell you about when we get started, and that is that um, I bought these beautiful knives. I figured with all this cooking I'm doing, I deserve to have a good um, chef's knife. So I bought um, the Meisen chef knife from Instagram. And I, I gotta tell you, I, you know, I'm not usually happy with my Instagram purchases. Um, in fact, um, some I've had to get really upset about. Um, there was this $90 like handheld projector thing that I thought was really cool. That didn't work out. Anyway, these Meisen knives um, are absolutely incredible. Um, best knives I've ever used. And uh, I am just so thrilled with this because it's such a pleasure to cut things with a good uh, quality knife. Um, and also, believe it or not, it's actually easier to hurt yourself with a dull knife than with a sharp one because you end up doing so much more work and applying so much more force and you end up with the knife instead of um, digging into a, 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 um, something you're cutting, it slides off the side. And that's how um, I think a lot of injuries happen here um, when you are working with knives. Okay, so all that being said, I think we're finally ready to start um, Sicilian pizza, which I've kind of crossed. I've kind of made my pizza travel north a little bit because, like I said, Sicilians use these big, like, 13 by 9 pans. Um, I've taken the more Neapolitan approach, which is a thin, um, uh, small crust, uh, pizza like that. And then I, but then I take the Sicilian bits of adding the onions and press them into the crust. Um, I do that to kind of combine Sicilian and Neapolitan pizza. I like the Neapolitan crust and the, the stone oven with the high heat or the wood fire heat. Um, but I also like the onions pressed into the crust. So kind of a kind of a best of both worlds sort of pizza. Okay, so step one, um, quite obviously, if you're gonna make pizza, we need to open a bottle of wine. Um, this is a Shalom uh, vineyard, um, 2016 Pinot, and it's from Shalom Appalachian. And I, of course, I've never heard of that. Uh, Monterey County. Okay, well, interesting. Then I'm going to grab a vintage wine glass. This is actually from my grandmother's house. You don't see these very often anymore um, with this incredible uh, etching. It etched this flower pattern to the glass. It's really neat. Okay. Cheers, Sante, which literally means to your health. Okay, let's begin. What's first? Almost always the onion. with these onions is to get a really nice uh, fine dice. Uh, now normally I would do these um, in the Cuisinart actually and chop them up in little bits but I'm so excited about these knives I just want to cut everything so um, I did it by hand. Um, okay so let's heat some olive oil in our cast iron so we can brown these onions. Of course I should have done this first. But that's okay that'll give me a chance to tell you about my other little side project here. Um, over in the pressure cooker, I have some artichokes going, and these guys have been in here for 20 minutes on high. And that's all it takes to cook an artichoke, which is amazing. Let's depressurize this and uh, take a look. So the artichoke is actually a thistle, 
I don't know who decided that we should start eating these things because they are very strange, but someone did it and I'm really glad because they're delicious. That's how you do not drop the knife on your foot. Don't try that at home. Okay. Pippin doesn't look like I damaged it or anything. Um, it's actually a really economically priced knife. The knife was, I believe, $59. Um, and the, there's like a deal on the paring knife too, so I got one of those. But that's a pretty good price for a knife. You can pay hundreds, probably thousands if you want to. Um, okay, so these artichokes, I've cooked them, I've prepped them first um, by taking the leaves and then snipping all around, uh, cutting off those, um, those sharp edges with kitchen shears. And then um, I've stuffed a little clove of garlic in there um, and some lemon, which I'm now going to throw away just for seasoning. And then I steam them in um, just a little bit of chicken broth. I would say, oh, I don't know, maybe about two cups of chicken broth in the pressure cooker um, to steam these guys. And you can stop there and just eat them. I'm sure they're delicious. Let's just try this guy here. Mm hmm. Mm. Perfectly cooked, tender, wonderful. Um, instead of stopping there, though, we're going to have more fun with these artichokes later. I have some ideas for them. I'm going to cut them in half and then grill them um, briefly and maybe stuff them with something. We'll see. There's a restaurant in San Francisco called Woodhouse, a Woodhouse Fish Company, and they do a terrific um, stuffed artichoke. One, they cut it in half. One half is stuffed with crab and the other with shrimp. Like a crab salad, shrimp salad, and that is a nice dish we can try to recreate here. But now we're focusing on pizza. So, onions into the cast iron. We're just using the back of the knife to keep it sharp. If you're doing any scraping, put the back of the knife. Um, I think it's got it for a second. And these onions, I'm going to hit them on uh, super high heat right now, on a max. I'm going to add some um, salt. This will obviously flavor that and also um, help the cooking process. It breaks down the onion a little bit and starts to brown up pretty quickly. These are small pieces, so they'll cook rapidly. Um, so we're going to saute these onions here in olive oil. Add Worcestershire. Give it a little umami, sweet, salty, anchovy. And as soon as these start to, um, to burn, I'm going to turn it down right before they start to blacken up. And then we'll let them simmer on low heat um, for a good long time, like a good 20 or 30 minutes, um, to really let them uh, brown up nicely and release some of those sugars. As I've said before, I think I read once that onions actually don't caramelize. We often talk about caramelized onions, but apparently they don't actually have enough sugar to properly caramelize. However, they do get really sweet and brown the more you cook them. Uh, of course, to a point. Okay, so let those go. And we're on the next step. The sauce takes an hour on the pressure cooker, in the pressure. So that means I want to get that process going because it's probably the longest pull in the tent. It's the thing that's going to keep us from eating. So, this pressure cooker, I gotta say, is probably the handiest thing I've ever bought in my kitchen. It just, it does, it's not just a pressure cooker, it's about this everything. Um, you know, rice, porridge, um, breakfast cereals, um, slow cooking, pressure cooking. Um, you can even do sous vide in there. And I haven't done a sous vide uh, demonstration yet, which is sad because, my gosh, I do sous vide probably twice or three times a week. I'm always doing it because it's such a great way to make sure you don't poison your family. Um, because uh, with sous vide you can guarantee, if you, as long as you follow the directions and you do it right, um, that the, the meat uh, is cooked all the way through. So I'm finding it, um, I've tried everything. I've tried sous vide, uh, beef, pork, um, lamb. I haven't tried any fish. Fish is really easy. But, um, but the thing I love with sous vide the most is chicken. Chicken comes out uh, really well, just evenly cooked and super moist, not dry. Um, and then once you've sous-vide the chicken, you can take it and do whatever you want. Turn it into chicken salad, or um, turn it into uh, parmesan, or you know, you name it. Fry it, put it over waffles. Um, 
when you fry a chicken that's already been sous vide, the frying process is so simple. You just quickly drop it in breadcrumbs. It's already wet from the sous vide. Um, most of the time I sous vide in buttermilk and a bunch of other spices and stuff. So I do that, it's already wet. Take it, drop it right in some monso meal or breadcrumbs, drop it right in the fryer for like 20 seconds just to brown the crust and then it's good to go. And it never even cooled off. It's, that chicken is still like right at the temperature you want it um, as though it came out of the fryer. But as with fried chicken, baked chicken, any kind of chicken um, that you cook outside of TV, it's really hard to make sure that it's evenly cooked. The chicken has all different kinds of parts, obviously, you know, bones and meat with different uh, fat content that cooks different temperatures. So it's really hard to cook a chicken evenly. And sous vide is, uh, is the answer. One of these days, I'm going to try a whole chicken too. I'm just going to drop a whole, like a small chicken, put the whole thing in there, um, set it to 147, which is the sous vide temperature, and then literally just cook it for like five hours until that whole chicken has reached 147. And then from there, I don't know what I'll do with it, but it's really delicious. Okay. So let's make the sauce. I've done this on so many other videos by now. You guys could probably be telling me how to make this. But yeah, so olive oil. We're gonna saute on low this time. And why did I choose low and not high? Olives. We're not doing onions, we're doing just garlic this time. The onions in this dish are, as we mentioned, pressed into the crust. And that's what we're doing here. So we're gonna keep them wrapped. Also gonna put them in the sauce, that'll be just too much onion. I'm gonna turn these down a little bit. We're starting to brown. Okay, so I've got some olive oil uh, sautéing here in my um, Instant Pot on low. I'm going to prepare some garlic. For a dish like this, um, two small cloves or uh, one big one will do. I'm going to use like this larger clove and this like medium sized clove here. Maybe this small one too. I'm using more garlic in dishes lately, um, because we don't go anywhere or interact with anyone but ourselves. It doesn't really matter if we all have like garlic breath breath. And as it turns out, garlic breath doesn't even smell like garlic. It really does smell just like this horrible, like dead animal kind of smell. So it's awful, but who cares? If everyone else has it, you don't even notice. Okay. Well, Prep our garlic. And of course, we don't want to put this garlic in that oil without having an open can of sauce handy. So we're not going to make that mistake. That's a, that's a beginner move. That's farm leaf. I believe these are whole peeled tomatoes, so they will need to be blended. Add about a third to half a can of water. Let's say a third, yeah. About a third of the can of water. We'll put that in here with the whole peeled tomatoes. We'll squeeze in maybe um, a tablespoon of paste as well. Um, to help that thicken up when it cooks. And then I'll put this right into the blender. Okay, we have our tomato sauce, uh, our canned tomatoes and paste ready to go. I don't want to neglect my wine. It's actually, I kind of like it. This is a Shalom. Mm. Mm. Uh, Pinots, um, Syrahs, and, uh, and GSMs have become my favorite uh, wines these days. But I will drink pretty much anything. To cool that pan, we'll just pop down just a touch because it's super hot. So I'm going to take it off of the Instant Pot. The heating element there is in the pot part in the unit here. Uh, here, so I can take this off and it quickly cools down because it's a thin uh, steel alloy. It's not cast iron or anything, so it really uh, cools down quickly. The cast iron part of the Instapot is the actually liner around it there. Um, that's where it retains the heat. So we'll dump that in and it already sizzles a bit. I'm going to put it back on the heat. Give it a quick stir and then in goes the tomatoes as soon as it's browned a little bit. Yeah. So you can smell that first little bit of rancid garlic smell. And that's when you know it's time to put up the fire, dump the cool tomatoes in there, and uh, and uh, stop the garlic from cooking so that it doesn't uh, turn your sauce rancid.
Okay, so then we'll set this to pressure cook now for one hour on high. You turn that in all the way down to low and add a little bit more olive oil because they're really starting to sing. You can, you can definitely um, char them, but you don't want to burn them. You know, reduce that heat. That this cast iron, as I just mentioned, it really retains a lot of heat. So um, you have to kind of treat, when you're using cast iron, it's almost like you have to treat the, uh, the heat as though it's an electric stove where the, you're going to get a delay. Turning a big ship. You turn the wheel a little bit and then kind of wait for it to come around. Okay, so those are looking good. How's the sauce over here? This is going to need the usual sort of Italian blend oregano, about two teaspoons worth. This comes out very slowly. That's pretty much the only real flavor in here besides tomato um, and uh, the other sort of things like salt and umami from Worcestershire that get you a little bit of extra uh, flavors. I'm also adding some uh, mushroom umami too. Uh, but these things are just to kind of activate parts of your palate. Really the only things you taste in the tomato sauce really just tomato, garlic, and oregano. I don't really feel like I taste much else. Um, I'll do some salt and pepper too. About a teaspoon of salt. Keep teaspoon of teaspoon. Okay. Same with the pepper. Very simple pizza sauce. Just a few ingredients. And the key thing with pizza sauce is, or any uh, tomato sauce, is time. I like a soup. Um, this is going to get better uh, the more you cook it, of course, within limits. Um, so to accelerate that cooking time, of course, that's where the pressure cooker comes in. So now I can set this to pressurize it for an hour on high. We'll put a lid on it, and then in one hour plus the time it takes to heat up the Instapot, we will have um, a beautiful and delicious uh, pizza sauce. So that's ready to go. So the onions now are simmering on low. Um, there's enough oil in here so they don't burn. I'm just going to keep cooking them like that for a good long time so they can uh, release some of the nice sugars and the flavors. Um, so we're on this nice wine too. I always tell people not to videotape themselves um, or take photos of drinking or um, or drug use, uh, but it's not going to go anywhere. <laughs> We're going to get in the car and get a DUI. I mean, really, now I don't, uh, I don't drive. I don't even know how many miles of charge I have in my car. I know where it is, but I don't even know um, how many miles are on the battery. I haven't used it in weeks. Okay, let's do some other pizza toppings. Yeah. Um, so let's heat up this olive oil on the back burner here. For this cast iron. I'll put uh, him on high. Get this one on low. Okay, wash this cutting board. So for the mushrooms, I just want to do like the equivalent of a uh, parboil um, but with a saute. Um, I don't know if that's called a par saute or what, but let's just call it, um, cook them a little so they're not raw and gross on top of your pizza. So that's going to be a little saute in here. How long? A couple minutes maybe. Um, Mushrooms, it's hard to overcook a mushroom, but it's easy to undercook them. Okay, we're just going to gently saute these in olive oil. Just to, you know, a little, little bit of cook time, so they're not totally raw when they go on a pizza. That's the idea here. It's not really, um, Super important because some people can tolerate things like raw mushrooms and raw bell peppers on top of uh, the pizza. I don't like that. So this might be a pet peeve, or it might be um, something you enjoy too. That should do it. Of course, they will continue to cook um, in the pizza as well, right? So it's going to heat down there. So that's good. Cook them a little bit. Slightly, slightly warmed up. Just not quite raw. And now, in a similar fashion, we'll do the peppers. Um, with these, I might cook them a little bit longer because I want to get that, that crunch out of it and achieve a, a pizza where you can bite through it without your teeth getting caught in anything crunchy. That's the idea. So we'll take an assortment of peppers here. Cut these guys up. 
thought I would do little rings, kind of like this. Well, that'd be fun. I'm all sort of cooking on their sides. They soften up a little bit. Okay, we have these nice little pepper rings. Now we're gonna dump those right here in this hot olive oil. I'm just going to zap these on high just for a couple of minutes and uh, soften them up. Meanwhile, the onions are nice and brown here. Um, you can taste them if you want to see if they're as sweet and as brown as you want them. Mm. Give them a little more time. We have plenty of time because the sauce still has almost an hour to cook. It's, the pressure cooker just went off, so we're at 57 minutes on the, um, uh, on the sauce, so we have some time make our toppings, grilled in artichokes, do whatever else we want. Um, and then when the sauce is done, um, I will come back and we'll start to top and cook the pizzas. Um, and just so you know, this, this pizza oven, this stovetop pizza oven, you probably want to preheat it um, for about a half an hour, maybe 45 minutes before you start to cook. So um, that's a good point. With 56 remaining on the pressure cooker, I'll wait till it gets down to about 30 and then I'll turn on the stovetop pizza oven um, and then when it gets to zero, we'll depressurize, um, we'll top the pizzas, put them in, and then uh, if everything goes well, hopefully we'll have lovely um, Neapolitan Sicilian pizzas. Neo-Sicilian? Oh, that sounds really awful. Okay, so an hour has transpired, and uh, there's two minutes left on the sauce here. Um, so we're going to continue with our pizza, but in the meantime, I thought take these artichokes and uh, cut them in half. Oh, even with this incredible mice and knife, it's still too difficult to cut that in half cleanly. Can't part kind of a mess. Um, let's try, you know what? Let's try a bread knife instead. See so if we can use a serrated edge. Love my mice and knives, but sometimes you just need a different kind of tool for the job, right? So that's a bread knife, that's the mice and um, chef's knife. Um, okay, so what I want to do is just take out some of the inedible stuff and throw it away. So that's basically all this purple stuff, they're sharp and gross, and all these um, white pieces, the seeds. So the thistle here, oh, there goes our Instant Pot for the sauce, that's ready now. So. I'll just hit cancel on that, let it naturally depressurize for a few minutes, and then we'll hit the instant depressurize and move on with the pizza. Oh, also, about a half an hour ago, I came in and I lit up the burner. Um, here, oh, I should put this on. It's not good. Uh, I'm supposed to put a cover on here. So, the pizza oven is heating up. It's currently at about uh, 450. Um, we're going to want to get that to uh, closer to 600 before we put the pizza in. So, it's going to get real hot over here. Um, pretty soon. I'm also going to turn on the vent fan here. I'm trying to draw some heat away from this area, which is very hot. Um, also, the onions, I should mention, are nice and brown and done. Um, these peppers are softened up a bit. I have the mushrooms here. I have plenty of wine, so let's get going. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of an artichoke here. So it's, it's a thistle, as I mentioned. Oops. And the thistle has these seeds, which are this part here. And then it has these very sharp, pointy blades here, these um, purple things, which would be kind of, if this were a flower, that would, you know, is opened up, those would be the purple um, edges on the thistle. Um, this is, so it's, it's like a thistle bud is what this is. Uh, and these are the, the blades of the thistle with the nice edible stuff here, which is delicious. Mm. So, oh, it's so good. Chicken broth is really good on our mm. Mm. Chicken broth, garlic, lemon, salt, pepper. Okay, so before I eat this thing, um, I'm going to take out just everything I think is inedible. So anything that's purple is not going to be good. So I'm going to lift this right out and pull out the seeds and all this other gunk that we're not going to want to eat. 
There might be some pieces in here that are good. Yeah, I went a little too deep, so that's okay though. And I want to form a cup with the remaining artichoke, and right here, that's what we're going to stuff. And so I guess the next question is, what are you stuffing it with? Um, so that could be literally anything. In this case, I'm going to use something called caponata, which is a delicious um, Italian uh, relish um, that consists of eggplants, um, celery, onions, um, olives, and sometimes um, pine nut. Mm. I hope I said the main ingredient. Oh, capers too. The main ingredient though is eggplants. So eggplants, um, celery, and onions, all about the same size, uh, cut up and saute all separately and then combined with some vinegars and tomato paste. Um, you know what I'll do instead of just yakking about this? I'll, we'll do a, uh, a video on caponata or, um, or caponatina sometimes it's called, um, which you'll see on, on menus sometimes, which just means a little caponata, I guess. Uh, so whatever, it's a delicious, uh, uh, kind of an appetizer dish. You would normally serve it with uh, crackers, um, but I think it'll be lovely to stuff this artichoke with, uh, with caponata. Uh, it doesn't look that appetizing as it's been sitting in the fridge and the olive oil has kind of solidified. But as it um, as it melts down, it has this really nice sheen to it. It's beautiful. So um, let's just do that. Stuff that artichoke with caponata. Now for this remaining part. So this is the inedible part, but you don't want to be eating the, the seeds here. This part here is um, not tasty. Yeah. So I separate that from the good part, which is the heart. That's this part here, uh, and that um, is really delicious. Um, and unfortunately, it's been removed. I kind of wanted to leave it on there, uh, but I couldn't do that with all these all these extra um, leaves that you can't really eat. So, the truth be told, um, it's really just the purple part of this that you don't want to eat. So, this here is is a good um, segment of edible artichoke. So, let's see how we can do this. Let's get kind of creative about how we can present this and still, you know, use these yummy parts of the artichoke. This I'm going to throw away. Those are the seeds. Um, I could definitely like, carve out maybe some of this. Let's see. Or even, you know, I might go back to shears again. Because I used the shears a lot on the artichoke before, as I mentioned. I went all around the outside and I cut these purple parts off of all the outer leaves. So now I'm on the inner leaves. I'm just going to use these shears. See these up close. I'm going to just cut the, the nice green part away from the purple part. Hopefully we can leverage that somehow. Because artichokes are so delicious. But also kind of precious because there's just so little edible meat. Um, so I'm trying to salvage every last bit of it. So maybe I'll use this later in some other dish as part of like who knows, a soup or a dip or something? I don't know, we'll see. And if I did that, I'd probably want to take the, um, the heart, too. But as you'll notice, the heart is connected to these kind of like fibrous bits at the bottom here, these parts. So I want to get rid of those. Just chop those off. And I can kind of scrape off some of those that are, st that are staying on there. There's so much waste here. There's like a ton of uh, this fibrous garbage you can't eat. Uh, what you can eat is delicious. So we'll figure out what to do with this later. We have some extra heart here, and we have a little bit, we have some softer inner leaves that we can use. Now, and all that is uh, for this card pile. So now I'll just create the rest of these. Uh, this is the goal here. I'm making these little uh, caponata stuffed artichokes here. And meanwhile, um, our pizza oven, of course, remember this video is actually about pizza. Let's not forget. Uh, so the pizza oven now. Uh, okay, it's pushing like 520 or so. It's getting up above 500. So um, we're going to need to let that sit for another maybe um, 10 minutes or so. So uh, in the meantime, I'll just get this appetizer going. Okay, so what I've done here um, is created something I think is quite lovely, uh, a little uh, caponata stuffed artichoke. And uh, what's great about this dish, uh, put, some, put some Parmesan, a little uh, black pepper, and maybe a touch of 
crushed red pepper as well. Just kind of almost more decorative than anything. Um, okay, so this is a really nice little appetizer I created here. Um, and so yeah, caponata. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that in some future video. Um, and the artichoke uh, sits. Uh, they sit in those like little cups for the caponata. And so um, you could take this and maybe pull out one of these cups uh, each to serve it. And then when you're about to eat it, what's great about these little artichoke leaves is that you can just pull out a leaf, um, just like so, grab some caponata, and then here you go. Mmm. 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 Caponata artichoke. Yeah. Mmm. Now, yeah, this is a winner. Like I said, we're going to have another video on the caponata, but you saw what I did with the artichokes. And then, like I said, you can stuff them with anything you want, but I just had caponata from a few days ago when I made it, so there you have it. Anyway, yeah, you can, you're not going to believe how delicious this is. Um, so, yeah, caponata stuff, art, uh, artichokes. Okay, moving on to the pizza. Let's depressurize the sauce. Pressure cooker is getting a workout today. Okay, oh, by the way, all of this here is usable artichoke, so I'm going to set that aside for now and definitely want to use that later. My plan is to uh, to cut off and to peel off and to sort of scrape off all the usable parts and then create something wonderful with it. Um, and I haven't decided what that is yet, but maybe there will be a video on that later. So I'll save all this uh, leftover artichoke for a future project. I'm excited about that. I love artichoke, it's a great flavor. I don't know who decided that we should eat those things. I mean, they're gnarly and they take a lot of preparation. It takes a lot of work to turn a thistle into something you can actually eat. Um, but the tastes are just really good. Really wonderful. Uh, cardoons. One of these days, we'll get our, hand, uh, we'll get our hands on some cardoons. Cardoons are a cousin of the artichoke. And they are absolutely delicious. They're kind of like if you were to cross artichoke with celery, that's kind of what they are, like long stalky things. So they have these giant like fronds, like the artichoke plant, and they chop off the, um, the big leafy part and they leave just the stem. And that's the cardoon or cardoon, cardone, I guess cardone, I don't know. How. Whatever. Um, so that, uh, that piece is like a piece of celery and then you, you kind of peel off the outer layers, which are really uh, fibrous and, and edible. And then you can steam the inner part and then, of course, bread it and fry it like you all the Italians do with all their vegetables. Um, that's a video of vegetable. Anyway, a fried cardoon is kind of the same thing as a fried artichoke heart. They're about the same, just shape. Uh, it literally tastes exactly like artichoke heart, which is a delicious flavor. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they're hard to find, but if you can get your hands on cardoons, um, it's about the same as literally plucking out artichoke hearts and frying it. The amount of work involved in Preparing a cardoon versus preparing an artichoke heart to fry, um, I would say a cardoon is, is easier. Not by much though. Alright, so here we go. Let's do some pizza. There's our sauce. Okay, so let me show you how I would recommend preparing a Neapolitan Sicilian pizza, which is a blend of a Neapolitan crust, a thin crust, um, with a Sicilian method, which is pressing um, really well-cooked, um, you know, uh, ground onions uh, into the dough uh, before putting the sauce on. So I, I'm just, I'm pressing these onions in here as though I'm trying to like turn this piece of half-cooked dough um, into uh, onion focaccia. I'm pretty generous with this. I have four pizzas, but I'll probably just cook two of them tonight. So we'll make more onions next time. And man, these onions are actually, these are probably even more done than I would um, usually do. They're like even darker and more crispy and brown than usual. Uh, but that's fine. I think it's going to be delicious. So this is what my, my grandfather, my, my mother's side, uh, used to do is with the grilled onions. is press it into the dough. And it works better when you have um, a raw dough than it does when the dough is half cooked. But this half cooking part, it makes everything else so much easier. So, just gotta go with me on it. So 
what I'm doing is I'm leaving a little bit of, um, of crust around the edge. I'm leaving like an area here where there's no onions. Okay. That's going to be the crust on the outside. All right, so here's um, the sauce, which is really hot. I'm going to pour some of that on here. I have to kind of feel out how much sauce that pizza wants. I'll get it up to the edges. There we go. And now let's talk about cheese. So normally I would use um, heart skim or whole milk, low moisture mozzarella. Low moisture stuff is the uh, is the cheese that grates. The mozzarella really grates well. The, um, uh, the high moisture cheese uh, is more of the kind you would use for like a, um, a caprese salad, where you would cut a slice of it. Uh, you don't want to grate it; it doesn't really grate. It just kind of gums up the grater. So, I don't, so anyway, I don't have any mozzarella today, um, and given that I'm really not leaving the house except to take out the trash. Um, I am going to use cheddar, so don't tell anybody, whatever. Cheese is cheese, at least it's white, it's not yellow. And actually, you know what's funny is, um, I have kind of the soft spot for round table pizza, which is, you know, of all of the shit pizzas, it's like kind of the best. I guess that's a compliment. The best of the worst. Um, and I always like that they included a little bit of cheddar cheese on their pizza. I thought that was just nice. Maybe it was the color, I don't know. Anyway. Top it with some some uh, grated mo uh, mozzarella. We'll call this part skin mozzarella, and it's actually um, cheddar. Okay, maybe some of our toppings. Throw some of these uh, peppers on here. Some mushrooms. That oh, looks good. Okay. Okay, that's looking really good. I have a pizza peel here um, with some flour on it. It's basically a cutting board, but it has this beveled uh, edge right here. Uh, you might be able to see. Um, that helps you sort of scoop that pizza up. So we'll put that on the pizza peel. It should be sliding around freely like that. Um, let's hit it with a quick dusting of oregano. That'll be the last thing we do to it before it goes right into the oven. So with this pizza oven going at now, let's say close to 600 degrees, um, this shouldn't be in here for more than maybe seven minutes. Remember, I've already cooked it for um, uh, maybe three, two, three, three, four minutes. So now I'm going to cook the rest of it by dropping it right here in the oven. And see how easily it slid in there because it's already pre-cooked. So it's not this like flapping piece of dough you have to worry about. And later, um, when people are eating this pizza, they'll have no idea that you cooked it in two stages like that. Okay, so while this pizza is uh, cooking in the stovetop pizza oven, um, we can go ahead and get the second pizza uh, all set up to go in. And that way, when it comes out, the oven can go in. And you can keep that assembly line kind of fashion going. Um, that way, you uh, can feed everybody <laughs> within a reasonable amount of time. So, here we go, pizza number two. So, uh, one quick tip here that I, I noticed um, as I was putting this one together. Um, I kind of spilled some sauce um, and it went over the edge here and uh, past the sort of crust barrier. So I pushed it back in and then I put a knife, I put the bread knife under it um, just to hold it up so it doesn't leak over the edge. Uh, I'm doing that because I don't want the, um, the sauce to touch the pizza stone uh, because it ends up um, burning and making a horrible mess. Pizza number one is ready. I'm gonna grab another utensil. This isn't quite a pro move, but it helps you get the pizza out of the oven and onto the peel. So you can't quite get the whole peel in there. Just get it under the pizza. Here it comes, though. Oh boy. All right, look at that guy. Okay. How's that for a Neapolitan Sicilian pizza? Look at that, looks so good. All right, I'm gonna quickly move that onto another cutting board and then make pizza number two quickly uh, into the pizza oven. Here we go. We'll give that about nine or 10, uh, we'll say eight to nine minutes um, on about, uh, we're looking like 600-ish. 
Yeah, well, 550 to 600 is where the pizza oven is, uh, is going. Um, you want to let the pizza cool um, for maybe five minutes? Um, yeah, five minutes. We'll say before you cut it because the sauce will um, start to firm up uh, so it won't like run all over when you first cut it. Um, and now is about the time you want to call in your hungry mouths to eat this stuff. Um, and basically it's just, for me, another repeat. Um, I'm going to do one more and I'm going to save this last one here um, in the freezer um, for the next time you feel like having a pizza. Okay, pizza number two is coming out. This. Number three going in. So these nice little um, personal Neapolitan Sicilian pizzas. Um, I cut them into four pieces, and uh, let's give them a try. Mmm. Mmm. Delicious. Mmm. Bon pranzo. See you next time.